Grace and peace to you on this, the second Sunday after Epiphany, and welcome to worship with First Baptist Church of Colorado Springs. If you have somehow found your way to us via on one of our online platforms this morning, we want to extend an especially warm welcome to you. We are so thrilled and honored that you've chosen to worship with this body of faith this Sunday morning. Tomorrow is a special day. Because tomorrow we honor and we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And it is an especially special day for us because Dr. King not only broke, led the charge that broke the tide of racism in our country, but he's also an American Baptist pastor. He was ordained in our denomination. We get to lay claim to him. And so tomorrow is a special day for us. Uh, you know he was reluctant to answer that call, right? He, he didn't come straight to it. And on a day when we'll be talking so much about call and God's call on our lives, I wanted to take a, just a moment at the start of worship today as preparation for that to read you Dr. King's own thoughts on his call. He says, My call to the ministry was neither dramatic nor spectacular. He says it came neither by some miraculous vision nor by some blinding light experience on the road of life. Moreover, it did not come as a a sudden realization. Rather, it was a response to an inner urge that gradually came upon me. This urge expressed itself in a desire to serve God and humanity and the feeling that my talent and my commitment could be expressed through the ministry. He says, at first I planned to be a physician. And then I turned my attention to the direction of law. And he says, but as I passed through the preparation stages of these two professions, I still felt within that undying urge to serve God and humanity through the ministry. During my senior year in college, I finally decided to accept the challenge to enter the ministry. I came to see that God had placed a responsibility upon my shoulders, and the more I tried to escape it, the more frustrated I became. A few months after preaching my first sermon, he says, I entered theological seminary. And he says, this in brief is an account of my call and pilgrimage to the ministry. I don't know about you, but I still find his words inspiring and encouraging. And so today we want to encourage you to consider how you might honor Dr. King's legacy tomorrow. Will you take some time to read some of his writings, to listen to one of his speeches, to attend a Martin Luther King Jr. Day worship service, Will you roll up your sleeves and spend the day serving others? As we move into worship today, consider what might be the best way to honor Dr. King's legacy. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. Let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Here now, our call to worship from Psalm 139. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon mine. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. 
In your book were written all of the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand, and I come to end. I am still with you. As we enter a time of prayer this morning, I would like to encourage you to download the order of worship to see an updated prayer list. And in honor of MLK Day, today we will be praying an adapted prayer of his. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the inspiration of Jesus. Grant that we will love you with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves even our enemy neighbors, those who look different from us, think differently from us, believe differently than us, love differently than us. May we love them as you have loved us. And we ask you, God, in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the world are gigantic in nature and chaotic in detail, to be with us in our going out and our coming in, in our rising up and in our lying down, in our moments of joy and in our moments of sorrow. Until the day when there shall be no sunset and no dawn, empower us to be the hands and the feet that show your love in this world and fill us with the peace that goes beyond all understanding and when all else seems to fail, may we remember to pray as your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from 1 Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, 
visions weren't widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was laying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And he ran into Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go lay down again. So he went out and he laid down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and he went into Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lay down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up, and he went into Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy, and he said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went down and laid in his place, and the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. I wonder, have you ever heard the conversion and call story of St. Francis of Assisi? The, the very same St. Francis after whom a hospital in the north side of town is called, the same St. Francis whose statue you can find in nearly every yard in Santa Fe, always with a hand extended, always with a, a bird lighting on his palm. St. Francis was not born St. Francis. He was actually born Giovanni, or John, to a, a wealthy merchant of cloth in Assisi, Italy. And he soon gained the nickname Francesco because of his father's lucrative trading links with France. As a young man, Francis was not particularly religious, preferring instead a healthy nightlife of drinking and singing and otherwise carousing with the other young men of the city. A, a good party was his top priority in life, which isn't really all that different than our stereotypes of trust fund babies in the United States, is it? Francis didn't want to follow his father into the cloth trade. He, he wanted to be a knight, a, a protector of people, a rescuer of the damsel in distress. Uh, he wanted to be a hero. And so he joined the forces of Assisi in a skirmish against a neighboring city. But unfortunately, his side was completely wiped out, except for him, and he was captured and kept alive because he was valuable. He had a rich father. Surely his dad would pay a handsome ransom for his return. Ultimately, his father did pay that ransom for his freedom, but before he was freed, Francis spent an entire year in prison there. And he, he came home a profoundly changed person. Think about it. Before that incident, Francis was exceedingly popular, a great musician and artist, liked by everyone. He was the life of the party. And then he was thrown down into this hole and left to rot for a year. When he came out and returned home, he was completely disillusioned about his father's wealth. He was disillusioned with the life of comfort and the, the frivolity of a life spent partying. He, he tried to actually re-enter that world, but it just never fit the same again. And he just kept thinking there had to be more to life than jockeying for power, 
than trying to gain wealth, than the pursuit of pleasure. And after a season of of living as a hermit, it began to dawn on Francis that God was beckoning him. Come, Francis, follow me. From that point, Francis' life took a dramatic turn toward a chosen life of poverty. Famously, he even stripped naked in the midst of legal proceedings as a way of symbolically saying that he was renouncing his father's wealth, stripping himself of the very clothes that had made his dad so rich. And that is how the Franciscan order began. The order of those Catholic priests who are set apart by their vow of poverty and their commitment to living a simple life. It's a great story because of the radical nature of his conversion from a spoiled child of means to someone who renounced all wealth in the pursuit of being more like Jesus. I mean, can you imagine Paris Hilton or Kim Kardashian renouncing their family's wealth and taking on the vow of poverty in order to live more like Jesus. And we clergy particularly love this story because if God can do that with a wayward party animal like Francis, imagine what God can do with me, a willing participant. There's maybe no topic clergy love more than the topic of call or of God's call on our lives. If you were to spend a single day wandering the halls of a seminary in the United States, I bet you would hear no less than a dozen conversations on call on any given day. What do you think you're being called to? I feel like I'm being called to teach, but particularly to an Ivy League school. Really? I feel called to to do social justice ministries, ministries that let me feed and house those people who are hungry and in need of shelter. I feel called to preach, but preferably to people who already agree with everything I have to say. I feel called to chaplaincy or to campus ministry or to military chaplaincy. I don't know what I feel called to. The word call just reverberates off the walls of seminary hallways, but the thing is, I I rarely hear anyone talk about call in a way that's actually compelling to me. It usually seems to lack a sense of clear conviction One colleague in my seminary said he was there because his grandmother had told him his whole life long that he was going to be a great pastor one day. I'm glad that he has such a good, strong relationship with his grandmother, but that's not exactly the kind of conviction that inspires confidence. I think that's why we need to keep holding on to stories like that of St. Francis, like that of Billy Graham, like that of Mother Teresa, like that of Dr. King. It's why every once in a while we need to hear the stories of those like Samuel. Samuel was still just a boy at this point. He was the miracle baby of Hannah who had prayed to God to give her a child. And if God would do that, then Hannah would dedicate the child to the Lord as soon as the child was weaned. Soon enough, she was pregnant. God had kept God's end of the promise, and so Hannah would keep hers as well, bringing the boy Samuel to Eli as soon as he was weaned. And So we're told that the word of the Lord grew rare in those days. That 
visions were not widespread. And it's, it's no coincidence in our passage that Eli's eyesight had begun to grow dim. It's symbolic. Eli was the one responsible for seeing visions from God, but he had grown apathetic and too comfortable in his role. And thus, his physical vision had not only grown dim, but so had his spiritual vision. So it seemed like it was time to call his successor. So one night, Samuel was tending the lamp of God, which was supposed to burn before the ark all through the night, every night of the year. It was the kind of job that you would give an intern. It was a thankless job. It wasn't terribly difficult, but it wasn't fun either. You had to stay up all night tending to this one light, but it needed to be done. And so Samuel was tending to the lamp, waiting for morning, trying not to drift off to sleep when he heard a voice call out to him, Samuel, Samuel. The boy assumed it was the old blind Eli and ran to him saying, here I am, here I am. What is it? Do you need a glass of water? Eli said, what are you talking about? I didn't call for you. Go back to bed. Samuel went back to tending the lamp and soon enough began to drift off a second time. The Lord called Samuel, and again, Samuel ran to Eli saying, Here I am, and again Eli said, I didn't call you. You must be having the most vivid dreams. Go back to bed. A third time, a voice called and Samuel came running to Eli, but this time Eli had begun to grasp what was happening He had been Samuel once, inexperienced in discerning the voice of God. It it wasn't just a vivid dream or the overactive imagination of a child, but the voice of God speaking to Samuel, calling Samuel, and Samuel didn't even realize what was unfolding. This time, Eli said, Go lie down. And if the voice calls to you again, say this. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel went back to his place. And the voice called again, Samuel, Samuel, which literally means God has heard. And this time, Samuel didn't get up and run to Eli. He sat right where he was. And he said, speak, for your servant is listening. And that is how Samuel was called by God. We ministers love this story too. Maybe as much as St. Francis' story, maybe even more, it's easy to see why, what with Samuel being called to serve God ever since he was a young child. In fact, we clergy like to see ourselves in Samuel. The longtime Old Testament professor, Don Jewell, points to this passage as his favorite passage in all of Scripture because when he was just a boy, he had opened his Bible and read this story, and it gripped him. He said that after reading it, he set his Bible down. He went directly to his parents, and he said, when is God going to call me? And he knew from that moment forward that he was going to be a pastor. It's a powerful image. And when you hear stories like that, it's easy to see how we clergy gravitate toward it. But unfortunately, all too often, this passage is preached as if some are called into service of God and some are not. 
It's preached as if some of us are called to be the pastors and the preachers and the chaplains and the missionaries who do the real work of the kingdom while the rest of you are just lowly church members who volunteer a couple of hours to the kingdom once in a while. It's preached as if we clergy are of a higher order than everybody else. Does that sound right to you? Or does it sound like it might be teetering on the edge of idolatry? Do you know why we Baptists have the communion table down here on the floor? If you were to go to a Catholic church, the communion table would most likely be elevated up on some type of stage set behind some kind of barrier so as to prevent you, the the lay person, from approaching it directly. Instead, the priest would stand between you and it, keeping you one step removed while he administered communion to you. But in Baptist life, we have put the communion table down on the floor, not elevated on a stage, not behind a barrier, but on the floor. We have put it on the same level as the people, as a symbolic way of saying that you do not need a priest to stand between you and God. You don't need a mediator. We are all on the same level. Our historic belief is in the priesthood of every believer. You don't need to confess your sins through me. You can pray directly to God. You are a priest in your own right. Sometimes we call this soul freedom because it holds that each person has both the freedom and the responsibility to relate to God directly. But the priesthood of every believer carries with it another responsibility. If every person is a priest, could that also mean that all people are called? Maybe not called into full-time vocational ministry. We need to use a larger imagination than that, but still fully called into service of God's kingdom. I think that we are. I think that the question is not, are we called? The real question is, how do we know what we're called to? Would we dare say that we have heard the voice of God? Maybe some of us would. Or maybe we would just point to the encouragement of trusted voices in our lives, those of mentors and friends and family. Or maybe we would say that our call has been clarified by the words of Jesus, and that has helped us understand our call to serve the kingdom. Or maybe our own life experiences and our own unique talents have given us a a better understanding of how we are called. Frederick Buechner has said, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep need meet. Has that rung true in your life? Or does that seem a little too pie in the sky to be true. How in the world can we ever know with any confidence we are in the right place doing exactly what we're supposed to be doing without the voice of God speaking to us? My experience is that trying to discern how you are called is sort of like trying to hit a moving target. That's because our lives are not static. They're they're dynamic. They're always changing, always moving. And so I'm willing to bet that our sense of call will be different throughout the different seasons 
of our lives. When I was in junior college, a man named Arlano Funderburk became my mentor. He had been doing ministry on that campus for 30 years at that point. And so he was on the downward slope of his ministry, not unlike Eli. I remember sitting with him one day after some event that we had hosted and we were chatting about life and purpose. And here I was, a naive 23-year-old, absolutely unsure of what to do with my life, absolutely unsure of my own identity, pretty much unsure about anything. And sitting next to me was someone who had devoted his entire life already to serving God's kingdom. As we sat chatting, he started to reflect on the reality that he knew that his years were numbered, that his public ministry was winding down, that he had less time on earth than the days he had already spent. And he looked at me and he said, Dan, I don't know what I have to give, but I do know that whatever I have left, I want it to count for the kingdom of God. Maybe that's the question we ought to be asking, not does what I'm doing, does my deep gladness meet the world's deep need? But does what I have to give and what I am giving matter to God's kingdom? The truth is, our God is a utilitarian God. God is constantly using broken vessels like you and me to carry water. From Genesis to Revelation, the story of Scripture is that God partners with people to work redemption in this world, sometimes calling hundred-year-old couples to bear children, sometimes calling devious tricksters, sometimes calling little boys to face giants, sometimes calling young women to bear the Savior of the world, sometimes calling children to replace the experienced wise priests. We can't be everything for God's kingdom. But God works through us, calling us into service. Not to be the Savior, but to play a part And so while we cannot be everything, we can be something. It was several years ago on a Tuesday morning. I was up the street at Ecumenical Social Ministries taking care of a couple of business items, and I happened to step out the front door of the building right as the executive director, Ann Lance, was pulling up and getting out of her car. I stopped to chat with her for a minute, and as we talked, a group of 80-year-old ladies, volunteers, stepped out the front of the building, all laughing and carrying on and having a good time. They waved at Ann, and they kept on up the street, and Ann kind of elbowed me, and she said, Dan, do you see her right in the center? The ringleader of that group, that one right there. Her name is Judy, and she went on to tell me that for 30-some years, Judy attended a Tuesday morning Bible study at First United Methodist Church. But that just a a year previous, Judy had come to Anne and told her that she wanted to start volunteering on Tuesdays instead. Anne said, I told her that that was great, but I also wanted to know why. What, What had brought this on? She said, Judy replied by saying, and for 30 years now, I have 
studied the Bible. And I just kind of reached the place where I felt like I had to start doing what it said. Ann said, Judy never missed a Tuesday after that conversation. I suspect that this is what genuine call looks like. It doesn't always look like going to seminary and getting ordained. More often, it looks like someone who has found it in themselves to say, I want whatever I have left to give to matter for God's kingdom. And then, without pomp or circumstance, without trumpets or any kind of fanfare whatsoever, They go about living into that commitment. But it almost always begins when we start to feel the nudging of the Spirit of God and we are prepared to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Amen. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. When we allow freedom to reign, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening sky let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought. Sing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won.
Let us close our time in worship together this morning as we so often do with an open-eyed benediction. Let us go forth from this time striving to know all of our brothers and sisters in the same way as God does. The God to whom in both life and death we belong. May we see and celebrate the gifts of all. And may we watch with wonder at how God weaves all of our gifts into the tapestry of God's one kingdom. Amen, First Baptist family. Go in peace.